Page five, general norms. I don't know how well versed of you are in, at canon law. I brought it with me, okay? <laughs> I'm not here to make you experts at canon law, but we have to understand what the universal law of the church is. So what you're gonna see in every section, we're gonna be quoting in canon law. It's just canon, so-and-so, they're all numbered. And then we're unpack it, and that's what the notes are. So every section has the canon law, then there's notes to unpack. But there's also law from the Diocese of Fargo, particular law. There's also norms given by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, and that's incorporated into this document. So we kind of did the work of pulling everything together to, um, to, to do this for you. It was interesting, the last time we've updated our policy, the diocesan policy in Sac Sacramento Records was December 22nd, 2010. 2010. And what I should probably mention too, as long as I'm thinking about uh, former policy, the document you have in your hand came from this document. This document was put together by the former chancellor in 1998. Some of you may have this in your uh, parishes. It's an excellent resource. It was the foundation of this work. If you have this, though, throw it out. Okay, it's been superseded by this. It's, all this is in here, and then some new law as well. So this was a great resource. If you have it, though, it's now been superseded by what you have in front of you. But again, it was a great help, um, and I, I thank Father Irwin for putting that together. But anyhow, in 2010, we've had an update to Sacramento policy, but even in the policy, it said in this document from diocese, referring to a USCCB policy of 2000, it said a copy of this policy, the USCCB policy, is to be maintained in the baptismal registers of each parish. So if I go out to your parish, will you have that document that the USCCB be published in, 20, in 2000 in your records? I don't know, I would doubt it, but again, that 2000 document, which we were told in 2010 to put in our baptismal records, is in here now. It wasn't in this earlier document, that's why um, we, we need to get rid of this, because that 2000, and I'll point out when we get to it, it has to do with adoptions, how do we record adoptions? The United States Catholic of Conference Bishop says, do it this way, and you'll see that in here when we get to it. So there's universal law, there's law for the United States, and then there's diocesan law, and again, it's all incorporated into the document. So back in page five, canon 535, each parish is to possess a set of parish books, including baptismal, marriage, and death registers, as well as other registers prescribed by the Conference of Bishops or the diocesan bishop. So what does the church ask every parish around the world to have? A baptismal register, a marriage register, and a death register. Every parish in the world is to have those books. It also says the USCCB or the Conference of Bishops may have other docu documents. They don't. The, our diocesan bishop, though, requires you to have a confirmation register. Okay, so that's particular law. It's not universal law, but it's, it's particular law. And then, <clears throat> uh, Uh, okay, section three of Canon uh, 535, each parish is to possess its own seal. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, the end of 535.1. The pastors to see that these registers are accurately inscribed and carefully preserved, so that's why you're here. So thank you for the work that you do to, as you said earlier, make your pastors look good. Uh, number three, each parish is to possess its own seal, documents which are issued to certify canonical status of the Christian faithful, as well as acts which can have juridical importance are to be signed by the pastor or his delegate, We'll come back to that in just a second. And sealed with the parish seal. So use those parish seals. It puts a stamp of approval on that document. Again, we're going to unpack that a little bit as well. Number four, each parish, there is to be a storage area or archive in which the parochial registers are protected along with letters of the bishops and other documents which are to be preserved for reasons of necessity or advantage. The pastors should take care that all these things which are to be inspected by the diocesan bishop or his delegate at the time of visitation or some other opportune time does not come into the hands of outsiders, okay? Have the, has the diocesan bishop ever inspected your sacramental records? Well, let's push it. Has his delegate ever inspected your sacramental records? And the answer should be yes. Who is that? Usually the dean. The dean, called a dean's visit. He will pull out your records and try to ascertain, are you keeping the records accurately? So these dean's visit happen periodically 
that he is the bishop's delegate to do that. It's all been done in all your parishes because they do that on a regular basis. So, um, point number five: old registers are to be carefully protected according to the prescripts in particular law. We'll deal with that uh, a little bit later. So now an explanation on some general norms. Again, uh, the required records, we already went through them, baptism, confirmation, reception, full communion, you can have that register as well. It's not required, but it's recommended, marriages and deaths. Well, what was that last? The, the regist register of deaths. No, did you say something about reception and the- Receptions and the full communion could be a book that you keep. It's not necessarily required. And you keep that in your baptismal? Yeah, well, yeah, everything, everything happens in your baptismal record, but there could be a separate book on that as well. There could be. Yes? That wouldn't be the same as the book of the elect. That's the, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, that they sign on yeah. during the Easter. No, no, the book of elect is for uh, catechumens. Yeah. This is receptions in the, in the full communion, which is not, if they're baptized already, they don't, wouldn't sign that book. But, and, but the simple point is there might be other records you're keeping. So what we need to be attentive to is what happens how do the books work together? We're going to circle back to that. How do these books work together? So, um, but there are a series of books. Some are mandated, but some of them are not required. Uh, even when a parish serves as pastor of more than one parish, separate registers are to be maintained for each parish. For security and convenience, however, the registers may be all stored at one of the parishes. So we recently had Hertzfield closed. Hertzfield has its own records. But, and we'll get to this in just a second, where are they now? But the point is they have their own records and they're being maintained. Um, I don't even know where they were maintained before they were closed. But you know, they, weren't main, they weren't stored there at Hertzfield. The parish uh, maintained them and then when they were closed, they went over to uh, the new parish. The next section, legal documents. Sacramental records are both private and public. Because the record itself is private, while well, the sacrament that was celebrated was public. The record was private when it was created, but can become public when it needs to stand in civil law for documentation. Usage of sacramental registers for historical, genealogical, sociological, or demographic studies must always protect the privacy of persons named in registers. And we're going to talk about that a couple different ways uh, as we go through this morning. But every individual has a right to their own sacramental records as long as they provide proof of who they are. And there's the next section that we're going to go through called con confidentiality. How do we do that? How do, how do they present themselves? Who has a right to their sacramental records? But that doesn't mean they have a right to inspect the book. They have a right to the record. And those of you who've done certificates knows what this looks like. I don't think there are any non-parishes present, but the next section has to do uh, with non-present register, non-parish registers. You can read that if it applies to you, but basically you're to work with your neighboring parish. Page six, format. Registers are available from private vendors. Here's a sample of a baptismal register. It may or may not look like your baptismal register. That's okay. Every publisher is gonna have their own style, own format, that's fine. Parish may retain uh, baptismal confirmation, marriage and death registers, or a combined register. I don't know if you've ever seen that. In one cover, they could have a section for baptism, a section for confirmation, a section for marriage, and a section for deaths. And some real small missions do that, which is fine. My only note of caution about these things, we do not recommend any vendor, we, there's no reason to do that, but they're gonna, every vendor is gonna have their columns. But make sure whatever the, the, the church requires as being recorded, it gets recorded, whether the column there is, not, is there or not, okay? Sometimes you won't find a column for it, but there's gonna be a place that you can notate it. So you notate it as well. Um, and I'll return back to this book as well. So we don't recommend uh, any particular vendor, just make sure that what needs to be recorded gets recorded. Computer reproductions. Sacramental records may be duplicated on computers, but a complete written, re written record must be maintained in the registers and the registers themselves are never to be destroyed or discarded. The registers themselves are considered the only authentic copy of sacramental <laughs> records. Okay, you, the computer can help you. A computer is a tool, but this is your official record. And this is your only official record of sacraments. Not on the computer. We're gonna circle back to computers in the second talk of they're great, but we have to be very careful that they're not um, permanent archives for anything, not, more, much less sacramental records. <coughs> Repairable registers, uh, oh, as registers become worn, they can be rebound by a professional binder. Only if a register is beyond repair may the records be transferred to a new register. 
The original register is to be retained in a safe, in as safe a condition as possible. Now, be careful about rebinding rec records if you find things recorded near the margin. If rebinding is going to lose the information, do not rebind the volume. As it indicates, you can copy out the entry, or we have this real wonderful technology called photocopying. <laughs> if, you're, if your register is beyond repair, that is, if, if there's a danger of, of rebinding it, you lose information, make a copy of it, take that um, a volume, you can store it, or you can give it to us and store it. We have a number of volumes in our archive, which Paris has handed over to us saying, these are hundreds of years old, and they're too fragile for us to handle anymore. And so we do do that. And I know there's some parishes here which are quite old, that if, if there's something too fragile to be, ha to be uh, um, handled, take care of it, okay? Uh, again, we have technology now to re really easily uh, reproduce things. But be careful when you're repairing things that you don't um, uh, destroy the original inscriptions. Safe storage, the Sacramento records that would be stored together in a fireproof or fire-resistant locked place. And there's a lot of different ways of doing this. It could be a safe, it could be a file cabinet, things like that. They may be removed only by authorized personnel, only for legitimate purposes. And again, we're going to talk about that in just a second. The registers may never be taken off parish premises except for archiving by the diocese. Okay? I heard some OOs out there. Just be careful, okay? You asked me to bring them. No, I know. <laughs> So you brought them today for archiving purposes, okay? You want them to be maintained, which is great, which is great. But, but these records belong to the church. They're property of the church. They're not property of any individual, including the pastor. So they're your, they're, please, please keep them safe. The loss or destruction of any sacrament or register should be reported immediately to the chancery. Let us know if something's uh, missing. We try to scan them on a periodic basis. So if something goes missing, we can actually give you a copy of it up to the point that we have scanned it in. So if it's a couple years old, you're missing all those, all those newer entries, but uh, we can actually do that as well. So, okay. I'm sure this is the next section, something you've been waiting for, confidentiality. Care must be taken to protect people's privacy. Although Sacramento registers contain information about public events and other facts readily known to interested parties, they also contain information which is very personal and confidential. So this section is gonna go through how do you handle this information? I've already said this, uh, Sacramento re registers belong to the individual parish. They are maintained for the good of the Christian faithful, but access is limited. So who is it limited to? The pastor is al always and ultimately responsible for the care and confidentiality of the Sacramento registers themselves as well as any reproductions. He may designate other persons to make entries in the Sacramento registers and to prepare certificates. The number of you here probably do that. These may be employees or volunteers, but their numbers should be small. These designated persons must be known well to the pastor, must be capable of careful work and protecting confidentiality, and must be adequately trained to work with the registers. So I know a number of pastors have been very good about training their staff how to deal with these things, which is wonderful. There is a norm in canon law, and this is the way I learned it, some of the other priests may learn it a little bit different, is that if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. So, if pastors are, desi are designated persons to care for their registers, that should be in writing. If it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. So if your if pastors are doing this, or if you as an individual haven't seen the letter, go back to your pastor and request one. If you don't know what that letter looks like, call us. It's not complicated, but what we, what we want to do is somebody says, well, I don't know who this lady is who signed the certificate. She's the lady who's been designated by this letter, uh, by the pastor on such a date to do this work. So it's, 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 it's documenting what the pastor desires. Because the pastor's going to move on. The pastor <laughs> may suddenly die. See, that could be your job description also. It should be in writing. I mean, it should be signed by the pastor. Um, yeah, I suppose, let's, yeah, if, let's look at, I mean, you can t have a canon lawyer look at your job description, see if it's sufficient, but really it should be dated and should explicitly say this is what you're doing, but yeah, I mean, I, job description might work for that as well, so. But Father Zizinski, this is a, I mean, this is something that we, we've never enforced before, right? No, no, but it's, it's canon law, so, I mean, oh, yeah, right. yeah. But the point is here is that we just need to, one of those things that we haven't done, we know we're supposed to do. Yeah, we yeah, now, right. Right, and that's going to be applying just to things of, you know, it used to be done this way, and we're just 
encouraging that way. So again, we're, we want to protect everybody involved that if you've been de designated to do this, great, do it. We want you to do it. We, we, you, know, you, you have your talents and skills at the, at the uh, uh, at, at disposal of the church. That's a beautiful gift. Yes? So is that letter like on the website that we could? No, we don't have that. You just call us and we can just email you a sample. And maybe we will, once we get a sample done, we can put it on the website. Because I'm yeah. thinking there's probably nobody that has that. <laughs> no. Well, but yeah, and, and but but yeah, but again, it's 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 a a norm of canon law that's maybe a follow up to the workshop would be just to mail it out to all the pastors. Okay, right, right, and all the pastors who are here are going to get get their copy of the of the book before. So that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Final sentence about uh, personnel is the work with the registers is not to exceed their mandate from the pastor. Okay? If you're there to record things, update the records, you're not there to do genealogical research. Okay? So, um, again, talk to us and, and yeah, we can, we can work through these things. And again, it's not rocket science. It's, you know, what, what does the pastor want you to do? Document it and then get it done. So, on page seven, genealogical research. Sacramento registers should never be made available to genealogical researchers. In other words, you don't take your volume and say, oh, you want to do your family research? Here it is. Don't do that. These are not their records. They have no right to see confidential information in there. So how do you handle this? The pastor or other regularly designated person may research information as requested and as time permits and make the information available on separate paper, for instance, photocopies. A reasonably hour rate may be charged for this service. You're no longer working for the parish, you're working for this individual. Tell me how much do we charge at the diocese? $25 an hour. $25 an hour. I know one diocese charges $60 an hour. Wow. I mean, but it's, it, you know, you're spending your time on it. What's a reasonable rate? You've got two numbers, maybe less, maybe more. We're not gonna determine that for you. Um, care must be taken not to disclose confidential information. So with a photocopier, you'll cover up adjacent uh, entries. If there is something notated as confidential, cover that up as well. They have no right to that. You, know, you can do this work for them, but it's going to take a little bit of work. We do this work rarely at the diocese, so um, the genealogical researchers do not have to write this. What information would be confidential? Uh, we're, Adoption records? We're going through it. It's all going to be noted. Yeah, no, that's fine. No, I, I, I agree with you, yeah. Um, Mormons, do not do any work for Mormons, okay? Don't do any work for Mormons. We're not here to do their work, so you don't hand these works over to them. If they don't have a right to the, the records, you don't give it to them. It's not their business. There are records, okay? All right, entries. All and only the data required by canon law and other necessary, otherwise necessary for the complete and accurate maintenance of Sacramento records is to be entered in the Sacramento Register. So it's, as we go through, you can see, you know, make these entries, make these entries, and sometimes you need to document things, so we'll, we'll, we'll work through that in just a, a second. Entries made are to be made promptly as soon as after the event, accurately and legibly. Timeliness. What is the law in North Dakota about how soon you must get a marriage license in to the courthouse? Five days. Within five days after the marriage, that, that record must be there at the courthouse. If it's six days, guess what? It's null and void. You got to do the marriage again. Yes, that, that's, that's civil law. Look it up. That's civil law. So what, how can that apply to us? Get it done promptly, okay? Get these records done. I'm dealing with a parish now that's been over a decade. It's over a decade, that should never ever happen. Do it promptly. If you need help, call us. And we're helping them, which is great, which is wonderful. <laughs> Not everybody wants help. And I'm dealing with another situation. He doesn't want help. Well, do I need to go in there with a the mandate of the bishop and say, Father, let's sit down and look at this. If it comes to that, I'll do that. I don't want to do that. But if I got to do that, I have to do that. These are not his records. These belong to the church. These, uh, these are maintained for the faithful. So timeliness is important. Place of entry. As a central rule, the proper parish for the recording of sacraments and deaths is a parish in whose territory the sacraments or rites of Christian burial were celebrated. Okay? So if someone comes from California to celebrate a baptism in one of your parishes, you record the baptism in that parish. That's where it belongs. If one of your parishioners goes to um, Fargo to get married, 
The marriage gets recorded there. We're going to talk about, again, how things get communicated back, back and forth with um, the baptismal record, and most of you have seen this already, but the proper parish is, is the place where the sacrament was celebrated. So about every burials, though, funerals. We're going to circle back to that? Good. Yeah, yeah, because I, yeah, it's, and uh, when we did this workshop last week, people were really, really surprised by our law about that. It's like, really? Okay. But we'll get there, so, yep, right, very good. Are you also going to cover baptismal marriages in emergency situations? It's all in here, Father. It's all here, yeah, yeah. You guys are really chomping at the bit, so let, let's get done with general norms first. Uh, chronological order, prefer to enter them in chronological order. That sometimes doesn't happen where you have to go back and say, oh, we missed a record and it's going to jump out of chronological order, but that's, that's okay. Uh, specific columns, each, pair, each page of the register has several columns. Each column is titled. Uh, enter the proper data in the proper columns. If um, the, the church law asks for certain things to be recorded as not a column, make them in the notations. Different registers have different ways of titling that, that column. Sometimes it's called remarks, sometimes it's called notations, it could be other things. In this work, we're consistently calling it notations, even though the register itself may have a different title to it. So there's gonna be a little section uh, in the register for that. Every uh, register has an index. So as you're entering things in the book, Chronologically, go back to the beginning and record them according to, now what does it say about this? The male's last name and the female's maiden name. Okay, so if we need to look up a record, we can find it in here. And again, most registers have an A through Z index, so you just put the name in, uh, what page is it on, and, and move on from there. So it's not complicated, but it really, really helps sometimes locating records. Uh, I've already indicated there might be a situation where a record is out of chronological order, and maybe someplace else in the register, and the index will help you find that. Excess data, okay. Let's consider briefly the record of Carl Wojtyla, who became Pope John Paul II. I actually have this on my PowerPoint, and if you want to see it later, I'll show it to you later. But in the sacramental register, there's a place for his baptism. Great, let's record it there. He got recorded, his parents got recorded, his sponsors got recorded, he was confirmed, right? That got recorded. He was ordained a deacon. Okay, record that. He was ordained a priest. Hmm, where's that gonna go? Then a bishop, where's that gonna go? <laughs> then he's named a cardinal. Where's that gonna go? There's no headings for those things, okay? Then he was made a pope. Where do you think they put the notation that he was made pope? In the margin. Sideways. <laughs> Sideways. Yeah, we have no more room. Well, look what it says about excess data. If there is inadequate space for all the data to be entered, the excess data may be entered elsewhere on the same page or even on a different page of the register. So if one of your parishioners eventually becomes Pope, you may have to say in the notation section, see page 52, cross-reference it. Page 52, you reference back to page, whatever page it was on, here's page 12. Make your references back and forth. Of, uh, we didn't have enough space here, so let's make a, um, uh, an additional entry. All right, so um, that's important when there's excess data. Uh, Cross-references is essential. Do not add papers. Don't add sticky notes. If you add papers, there's no guarantee that paper's gonna stay where it is. Sometimes when we, we, we scan um, registers, there's papers in there that kind of just fall off, like, uh-oh, where does that page belong? Well, that page really shouldn't be in there. So excess data um, can be recorded elsewhere, but make, make it very, very clear where you, they find the data and then cross-reference back um, to that data. Uh, discursive material um, should not be written in the sacrament or records, nor should they be stored, nor should they be stored or filed in sacramental book. So we're going to see this in just a second, that there's going to be perhaps documentation that stands behind your records. Keep them in a separate file. Label it. This is it. And then on that, and on that documentation, indicate it's in the baptismal register, this page, this entry. That's why this document exists to um, uh, maintain, to stand behind what was a change that was made in the sacramental records. So sometimes you see that. Um, I don't see that a lot, but every once in a while. And you're going to see a couple instances where eh, it'd be nice to keep that documentation of why we're we making this change. Uh, printing, uh, please print neatly. Don't write in script. A lot of you will see older registers were written in script, which look, they look very beautiful, very wonderful calligraphy, but who can read it? 
who can read it. Um, it's kind of fun. I actually worked <laughs> on a Sacramento record that was written in old script German. And I had to, within a span of a day, kind of figure out what is that letter, and what is that letter, and what is that letter. And in the end, I said, this is the best I could do with what I think this says. And of course, it's written in Latin, so you're working with German script, Latin language, and uh, just do the best you can. Entries should be made in fade-proof, water, waterproof, black or dark blue ink. Okay, no pencil, please, these are permanent records. At the very back of this book, there are um, sample sections. So why don't we flip to this real quick, the sample sections. And it says the style, now, now again, this is best practice. If you haven't been doing this, don't beat yourself up. But the style says, uh, enter the last name in uppercase, okay? It makes that, upper, that last name jump out. If you haven't done that, that's okay, but it just makes it jump out. So you see these, um, and in fact, in, in this example, not only is the last name in uppercase, but the name of the town, a place of, uh, of birth is uppercase as well. Um, again, I, I work with Sacramento Records, seeing that last name in uppercase really, really helps find things very, very quickly. Again, this is the best practice. Um, so we're gonna be going through these samples as well, and that's why, why that's there. So um, printing, the name of the month is referred to using month numbers, et cetera. Now I'm back on page eight. And again, uh, as indicated there, we have samples that you can look at. Okay, next section. Data which is confidential and which should not be included on a certificate is to be so marked when entered in the register. <coughs> Quote, confidential, do not include on certificate. Again, we're gonna look at a couple of these samples. So it's actually notated there. So for instance, if you go to the back of the, you go to the sample section, it says record 712. Um, 712 says confidential, do not include parents unmarried, father attested to paternity, and ask for name on record. Okay, we're gonna actually deal with that situation in just a second, but it says confidential. So as you transcribe these things from the record to a certificate, it says confidential, you leave it alone, you don't transfer that, but everything else does. So you can see in a couple of situations where things get indicated as confidential, you mark them as confidential. Minister of the sacrament, the actual minister of the sacrament does not need to sign the register. If the person making the entry personally witnessed the event or has available a document, and below we're gonna to touch on what a sacramental record of baptism might look like, signed by the minister which certifies the conferral of the sacrament. In these cases, you simply print the minister in the register, and I'm assuming you Many of you do that, and we'll, we'll see that in just a second, how that, that works in baptism and marriages. Okay, certificates, certificates. A certificate is an official document certifying that a particular individual has received a sacrament. It is an exact duplicate of data already entered into a sacramental register, okay? All the data that's, that's indicated there, you're moving on to another piece of paper. Again, if you want to use a computer, that's fine. If you want to handwrite it, that's fine. But you're not adding anything. If you find it's information out, add it to the register first and then move it to the certificate. Certificates are probably intended for internal use, not for civil purposes. People can use them for that, but that's not what we're using them for. I mean, they, a person has a right to their certificate, we give it to them, they use it for a civil purpose, and if the civil authorities accept it, that's fine, but that's, that's you know, that's, we're using it for our internal use only. Okay, authorized sources of records. Only the parish or other location holding the original sacramental record may issue a certificate. Okay, we talked earlier about a baptism in, in California. Only that church can issue the certificate. You may have a copy of that information someplace else, but only that church can issue the certificate. The actual register must be used as a source in preparing certificates. We've already talked about computer work. Cross-reference what's on the computer with your sacramental registers. There may have been changes. What you want to communicate is what's in the register, so uh, make sure your computer uh, screen is updated. When a parish closes or merges, formal arrangements are made for the transfer and retention of its sacramental registers. Refer to the sacramental re registers page on the diocesan website, it's indicated there, for a listing of locations where the sacramental registers of former parishes are retained. We try to do the best we can, based on information we receive from you, keeping that list up to date. On the new website, you can now click on the, the church where that sacramental record is kept, and information on the church will pop up, including the phone number. So, oh, sacramental record for St. Clair's and Bernstein's and Napoleon, click on Napoleon, there's phone number, get them on the phone, 
talk to them, okay? So we, we try to keep that list up to date. If you notice things on our website are wrong, please communicate that to us. I've already had some conversations with people about where I find this. Well, fargodiocese.org slash Sacramento Records. It's there for your use, okay? And if people are, and, and we dealt with this recently, if people are uh, moving registers, this makes more logical sense that goes to a neighboring parish. Just, re, uh, just, just call us as well that this, re, this record was moved from here to here. And again, uh, if it's an email, I will print out that email and I'll stick it in the official file of that parish. So there's a record on such and such a date that this event occurred. Any member of the Christian faithful has a right to obtain a certificate of his of the sacrament he or she has received and which was recorded in his sacrament or register. But only that person, the parents of a minor, someone with legal guardianship or another, uh, and a bona fide a pastoral minister at another Catholic institution or agency has this right. Okay, this kind of, uh, uh, you're stepping down. The individual does, certainly the parents or guardian does when they're a minor. Um, who might be, be some of these other people? Might be the diocese. Um, other Catholic institutions, I don't know, nothing really is coming to mind. There might be situations where that occurs. Say it again. Tribunal, maybe. Tribunal, well, that's a diocese. Tribunal at the diocese will ask for records, sir. Sure. sure. But I mean, but th there might be other people asking these for their records, but really the individual does. But um, when the parents of a child are separated or divorced, both parents, regardless of the legal custody, are presumed, notice the word there, presumed, to have the right to a certificate. Um, that's what we simply presume. I mean, if there's issues there and someone complains, well, let's talk it through. Okay? Let's talk about how, how that works on page okay. nine. Yes, go ahead. So the reality here, like, you know, if you go to is that that comes from the Lutheran Church when people are switching over to the Lutheran Church, right. asking for right. documentation. And I said, we don't, I think I checked in. I said, yeah. don't do that. The individual can ask me for their documentation. Right. Right. Them, right. Them, right. Them, the, the, the individual can do with it what they want, but we do not transfer records to Lutheran churches. We just don't do that. They might do that among themselves, but we don't, don't even do that among ourselves. We don't even do that among ourselves. We, we don't say, oh, you're now living in uh, New York? Well, let's take your baptismal entry and send it over to New York. We don't do that. Stacey here in North Dakota. Father. So I have to say in marriage prep cases mm -hmm. that you need someone's baptism record, and mm -hmm. get it for whatever they don't, before the wedding, um, you can call the priest. At, that that would fall under. Yeah, you can. Yeah, exactly. Entities, right, 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 right. I. You know, a priest I, who did that and found out that this person had a previous marriage. You think, huh? <laughs> yeah. And uh, when the uh, proposed wife found out about that, that marriage got called off. It, it does. That's why. That's why we ask for those records as soon as we can. And I, in my second meeting, if I haven't received it, I really start applying pressure. Do you want this marriage to happen? I need to see that record. And it's amazing sometimes where, you know, it's usually the guy, you know, his, his mom <laughs> calls or whatever. It's like, you know, you're mature enough to marry, but you're not mature enough to call for your own record. It's just, just strange. It's strange, but anyhow, um, that's, that's guys, so, all right. What is the procedure for these requests? Requests should be made in writing, along with a copy of photo ID of the person making this request. We do have a sample of this form on our diocesan website. When we deal with records, it's, it's a, uh, uh, you know, what are we asking for when they're asking for this information? So uh, there's a template there if you want to use it. Telephone requests from a Catholic parish or Catholic agency, they are acceptable, but the written request and a log of telephone requests should be kept on file for a year. Okay, that's best practice. Just notate, okay, I did this and there it is, and after a year you can get rid of it. Because people may say, oh, how did that record get out? Well, so and so called on such and such a date, and this is why it happened. No information from the Sacramento Register should be provided by telephone or other electronic means except to another Catholic parish or Catholic agency. Even then, the care for privacy of persons is to be exercised. Okay. Uh, this is the tighter rule that we've been practicing in the parish. So, I mean, the diocese is serious about this? About what? The diocese is serious about, <laughs> about the written request because we get this frequently. But, I, but I, a written. I'm being very and man to have to but a, a written request could be email, though. That the email is written. Take the email, print it out. We're going to talk about emails in my second presentation. What should be on there so it's properly documented? So simply shouldn't be the email. The, the person's email address should be their full person. So if you're printing it out, their full name is not on there. You stick it on there. Just write it on there. That's a written request. Do you need to get a copy of the I'm sorry? Do you need a copy of the ID as part of the email? Right, but that, that could be scanned and sent in as well. Okay, so the diocese, now this is the diocese of students. 
the diocese, yeah, yeah, no. Sorry, I've never been no, but, 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 but you're here, that's great. You're here, that's great. Can I make a request over the phone from somebody that's doing marriage prep that wants their own? Yeah, but how do you how do you prove it's theirs? I mean, that's that's the question. I mean, fine, you're you're John Doe. Or are you John Doe? I mean, yeah, we're asking for proof. Well, we just need to we just need to have this clear. So right, no, yeah, yeah, this exactly. Is, this is an awesome policy. I'm sorry, it's bothering you. Here's yeah, no, yeah, website. right. No, these are best practices. I mean, especially there's a lot of scams. I mean, I don't know so and so from Nigeria really is going to give me three million dollars. <laughs> they might. I don't know, but prove it. So. Yeah, I mean, we gotta be careful about scams. I, I don't think, you know, we presume on, on good, people's good intentions. Um, these are not government documents, so that you can't really, really use for um, uh, 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 you know, imitating another person, but be careful, all right? Be careful. Yes. The request is, is both when it's a priest calling over the phone or an individual. Okay, if a priest is calling over the phone, he's gonna identify himself. He's gonna name the parish he's at. That all can be cross-referenced. You can look all that stuff up, up online. Yeah, you are Father So-and-So, and I see uh, on your official website you are there, and I do do that. Okay. When I get calls from dioceses, other dioceses, say, okay, very good, all right, I'll do this for you, I immediately pull out the book and say, is, is this the right address for this institution? So That's I, just because the majority of the time it's being given the certificate's over the phone. Right, right, no, yeah, exactly, exactly. But, but cross-check it, and, and, and uh, yeah, and, so again, I didn't have to keep record of that, though? You should. Again, if something goes out, people may ask later, why did, this, why did we get this record? Or, or, or how, why did my information go to that party over there? You should. So again, it's best practice. I have even received requests from priests and tribunals and over the phone. And I've asked them, will you send me an email with that request because I need it for my files? So then I have even from a priest or a tribunal that written request with my files. So that, and then when you, I'm sending it, I'm not sending it to an individual, I'm sending it to a Catholic institution. I'm never sending it to somebody's home, I'm sending it to the tribunal office, or the parish office. But I still ask them to send me an email with the request. And for the, the files you're talking about, would that be the marriage file, or would that be just a separate log that goes away in a year? Where do you put the, the... I have a separate, I have a separate file for those. For those requests. See, we don't, I don't even have a separate file for it. This would be a whole new... Yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's just yeah. my way of filing. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, it doesn't hurt. If people realize, we can tell them, this is a legal document. We want to make sure that your information is safe, and we want to make sure that you are going to stay our people understand that. They so we should always send it to the church, not to, like, the bride requesting it? Well, if, the, if, the, if an individual is asking for it, and they provide information yeah it's there you can send it to them individually but if it's, if it's, if it's a priest or somebody representing the church send it to the church so somebody asking for a baptismal record we can tell them send us an email mm -hmm. and a photo id yep. yep they can scan it in yep right so right i just got married and my got baptized down in oklahoma city so i sent them an email requesting for the copy of my records and they said, she must work in the chancery. <laughs> <laughs> Certificates should have an official appearance and should be issued in consistent format. Parishes may obtain blank certificates from co commercial vendors. So again, we don't recommend any, but there's one little note here. All certificates must bear the name and the address of the parish, okay? St. Mary's, but which St. Mary's? Okay, the name and address of the parish. Commercial certificates, um, most commercial certificates lack a pla place to note ascription. We'll talk about ascription later. It's a new law of, of 2017. Um, but that ascription should be on there once we start getting records that have ascription. We'll talk about that later, but it's, it's you know, they, most certificates lack a place, but if, if it's going to be noted in the certificate, you note it on the, uh, the, the, if it's noted in the register, you note it on the certificate. 
Uh, this nevertheless must be written in every baptismal certificate. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with description. We'll deal with it later. There's a half a page on description <laughs> later on. It's, right. As far as address, is, is it just sufficient to put the city or do you, would it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think city, city and state is sufficient. I mean, you're this St. Mary's, you're not that St. Mary's over there. I mean, if you're in a very large city where there's a couple of St. Mary's, yeah, put your address on, but that's not going to happen here in North Dakota. And so. it's okay if you write that in? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Required data certificates are to include all data contained in the sacrament or register, register except which is marked. You missed that thing. You did. Okay. Auth authentication. Uh, that's, that's fine. I'll be doing that throughout the day, so thank you for keeping me honest. Okay, certificates should be, should be typed, printed by a computer, or hand printed in ink. They're to be signed by the pastor or the pastoral administrator and impressed with the parish seal. Again, this is where that letter from your pastor stands behind. This is why I'm able to sign this. Photocopied and facsimile certificates are not to be considered authentic documents. So we do this in marriage prep. Um, oh, I got your baptismal certificate. Uh, I asked for a current one, though. You know, we asked for, what is it, six months? Within six months, yeah, exactly. So um, don't give me a photocopy of what you got when you were uh, newly baptized because I want something newer than that. Yes? Um, so as far as the parish seal, if we have um, records for parishes that have been closed, do we use the parish seal because I don't have parish seals for those old churches from... It, it's, you know, it's coming from New Rockford, so I would say if you don't have the old one, at least use New Rockford's. Yeah, yeah, because they contacted you they, they want to see that, yeah, if you have the old seal, yeah, use the old seal, but yeah, I, I would agree that some of these older churches no longer have them, okay? But yeah, make, make the a document look official, all right? Again, back to required data. Uh, certificates that include all data contained in the sacrament are registered, except that which is marked confidential, or which is extraneous to the person's canonical status. Um, what is that? I don't know, but when in doubt, just include it on the certificate. Data in the notations column are to be included, if there is no data in the notation column, the words no notation, um, if there is no data in, in the notation column, the word no, no notation should be printed on the certificate, but this is also true of the other columns that are required. So if there is on your certificate a place that says marriage and there are no marriages recorded on the certificate, please include no notation because that's what I'm going to be looking for when I do marriage prep, that, that there wasn't anything. Sometimes if it says no notation there, it's like, Yes. Was there a notation or not? Did they miss it or not? But if you're writing in there no notation, I know immediately you, you checked and there is no, no notation in your uh, register. Okay, I think uh, all of you know that. All right, here's another big issue as well, missing records. Sometimes when a certificate is requested, the record in question cannot be found. Okay, point number one, search diligently in your register books. Okay, check your index look at it, see if you can figure it out. If there is any possibility that the sacrament may have been celebrated, conferred in some other parish, a sincere effort should be made to check the sacrament records of the other parish or parishes. So you start calling around, okay? We thought it happened here, it's not there. There have been cases where a priest was visiting one weekend, he took the record back to his own parish and recorded it there, a neighboring parish. So sometimes this happened, all right? If such a search is unwarranted or fails, Canon 876 can be applied. So let's flip forward to page 12 and look at Canon 876. Page 12. Did I do that right? Okay. I'm sorry? Maybe my, maybe my pages are missed. What did they say, page 12? Oh, okay. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Canon 876. To prove the conferral of baptism, prejudicial to no one, the declaration of one witness beyond all exceptions is sufficient, or the oath of the one baptized if the person received baptism as an adult. That's all that's required to attest to the fact <coughs> of a missing baptismal record. You need one witness, but they are witnessing to something. Get it in writing. Again, I, uh, and what we're, what, what's happening now in Fargo, we're getting a new wave of immigrants. The recent stat I saw is 
of people in Fargo are foreign born. 8% of people in Fargo are foreign born. So they come and present themselves to marriage prep. They've come over from a war-torn place in Africa. Guess what they don't have? The baptismal record. What do you do? You start talking to them. Okay, we ended out. No, I was a, a child. Is there anybody, no, my dad's dead, my mom's dead, my brothers and sisters, we can't get a hold of them. Is there anybody who was there? Oh yeah, my uncle is here. And I had the situation. I had to sit down with the uncle and say, all right, tell me what you witnessed there. Can you attest that this young lady received baptism on such and such a date? Yeah. What was the date? I don't know. Is that sufficient? Yes. He's witnessing the fact that on this year, perhaps in this month, he doesn't remember the exact day, that's okay. So, back on page nine. If such a search is unwarranted or fails, Canon 876 can be applied. You sit down, you, you get a document, they sign off on this document. Only that data which can be vouched for with certainty should be entered in the registered, even though this may leave an incomplete entry. Okay, so I have an incomplete entry. But at least I have the fact that this young lady was baptized. The name of the witness, so you need record the name of the witness, the day of his or her testimony, and the words based on the testimony of, and the pastor's initials should be entered in the notations column of the register. Look at the back of the book, uh, example 713, we'll give you an example of that. Example 713. A Suzanne Mater was baptized on May 5th, 1975. Notice this is falling out of chronological sequence. The baptism right prior to her is 1989, baptism right after her is 1991. But this is a baptism from 1975. So go over to the notations column, baptize here per Mary Austin's, her grandmother's testimony, <laughs> and we've had a picture of it. That's great, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. And this testimony was given January 4th, 1990, and whoever TF was recorded the TF. Okay, you see how you do that? You just record it. You make a notation that this record was, was missing and I record it. Take her name, stick it in the index so we can find that in the misplaced uh, section uh, earlier. This procedure, back on page nine, this procedure would also be handled for persons who have changed their name. Again, the procedure is you search diligently in your own records, you look for other parishes, and if the record still can't be found, you get the witness of one other and um, you, may, you can create a new record that way. So do we have it written down to, like they're signing it? Yeah, they, they, they should have a signed document, and this might be a case where you have a, a separate file where these documents live. Yeah, yeah. And yes. Sure. Okay, I got two or three other questions, but go ahead. Regarding the um, certificate, if we know the person requesting the certificate, do we still need a photo ID from them? Can, can you certify who they are? I mean, it, it, you need certainty of who they are. So if they're your son or your daughter, no, you don't need a photo ID. If, you know, their neighbor that you know, but do you know them? That, that's the question. Okay. It's, it's, yeah, and if you can, if you know them, yeah, you don't need to ask for that, but do you know them? Father, do you have a question? The question is about, is it my responsibility having received the request for sacramental information to track down that information, or is it I can assist them by saying, I don't have that record here. Some records might be in this community or that parish. I'd suggest that you contact them. I would say if they're requesting it for um, to celebrate another sacrament like confirmation or marriage, help them. But for genealogical research, you're not, you're not bound by that. But it's, it's really up to you, Father, how you want to help them. Because um, you, know, you can only do what you can do and you only have so much time. So if you think it, you know, it's better that they search someplace else, you know, try to rock their brain where this thing might be. So yeah, just help them as best you can. Okay. But, it, but it's not my, so if somebody calls me in Animus and says, you know, I was born and raised around the Martin area. Okay. Okay. I don't have, so I have some records for Martin, I'm sure. Sure, Maybe sure. Harvey's got some. Sure, Jones sure. has got some. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. okay, I don't have that record right. in my Animus books. And you got. Maybe it's in Harvey, maybe it's in Towner. But you're going to have to come. You, you, an, you answered their question, and the record's not here. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. It's not my duty to call them. No. Tell them, send them to the website, say, here's, here's a map. Now we have all our parishes on a map. 
look at, you know, call around to all these neighboring parishes. So yeah. Question in the back? Yes. Um, on the document that you were referring to when they send the testimony, you know, the picture or whatever, now they put down that um, Father Martin Dunn was the priest, but I see that who the priest is of the church. Do, if they don't know who the priest was that baptized, they just put in that current priest? No. No, 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 no. If, if you're not sure, you're not sure, you can leave it out. Okay. Now, they, they, luckily they had, they had a photo. Oh. It says, it says they had a photo here, so maybe this uh, Father Martin Dunn had been there for, uh, what is this, 20, 24, no, 14 years, I'm sorry. Maybe he's been there for 14 years. I don't know. Okay. But yeah, yeah, they had, they, they, had, they had a photograph, which, which is great. That's, that's great proof, so good. Anything, other questions about missing records? Okay, you run, run into this from time to time. One point, I think God speaking when it says that if you're baptized as an adult, I'm fairly certain that literally means they're seven years old. So if the kid was baptized at eight or nine and there's no witnesses, he can testify. He can testify to himself, yeah. It, 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 um, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what, what the age cutoff is, but I, I agree with you. If there are certainly teenagers, they can attest for themselves. But at what, how, what's the lower age? I'm not quite sure. But if there's questions, of course, we can call you. Call, call us. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, good. Okay. All right. Next section is about changes. On the very bottom of page nine, once they enter in sacrament or register data is considered official and permanent, it may not be modified special under special circumstances. We'll see this on page 10. Original data should never be scratched out, erased, whited out, covered by a sticky note, or otherwise destroyed or obliterated. Okay. Nobody has any questions about that. That's good. So. Changes though, you see there's two major headings here. There's a styles heading and there's a heading about insubstantial and substantial changes. So the type of change that's being made. So let's look at the style of changes first. Minor, minor changes. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that a little bit down below too, but minor changes such as a correcting of a, a spelling may be made directly to the original entry. Such changes are to be made by simply drawing one line through the entry number or letter to, to be changed and printing them, printing the change immediately above or below it, initialing and dating it. So 713 is another example of that. But if you notice in 713, whenever this change was made, it was not dated, it was not initial. We don't know who it was, we're not gonna go back and change that. Somebody changed Susan to Suzanne, that's her correct name, she perhaps she provided a document say, look at my uh, driver's license, this is my proper name, fine, okay, we'll do that. And again, we'll go through this a little bit more, but, but a single line through it, date it, and initial it. On page 10, style for major changes, such as the record of an adoption may require that a new entry be created. In these cases, the original entry is to be, be preserved without change. A new entry with all the data from the original entry reproduced, except for the relevant change, change or changes, is to be made in the same register as closely as close to the original entry as possible. Both entries, as well as the listing in the index, are to be cross-referenced. And the words, do not issue a certificate from this record is to be printed carefully across the face of the original. So 714 shows you that. Now again, the do not issue certificate is kind of off in the notations column, but then it refers you to page 86, which is the very next page, sample page, and so we got page 86, entry number 816. You see the record was moved forward from there, and then that became the official record. Okay, those are substantial changes. We gotta really rework this record. Let's go put it in a different part of the book, but let's cross-reference it as well. Okay, what kind of changes are there? Back on page 10, an insubstantial error, such as a mis misspelling, may be corrected upon request of those persons who have a right to a certificate, as mentioned in the certificate section above. So again, the individual themselves, or their uh, parents or legal guardian if they're underage, and I think that's pretty much it. You're not gonna say, a pastor's gonna call you and say, hey, so-and-so's name is misspelled. Well, let me talk to them. Let me get some proof of that. Substantial changes. More significant errors and other changes require authentic supporting documentation. Such documentation would only consist of an original race seal certificate from a civil or ecclesiastical authority, court, agency, et cetera. The issuing agency, data certificate, and any protocol number should be printed in the notations column of the register. When the, in an error involves data pertaining directly to the celebration of the sacrament or right of Christian burial, 
for instance, the date for the identity of, of God parent, such that no external uh, verifying documentation exists, the written or oral testimony of a reputable witness will suffice. Okay, so um, we're going to come back to the question of paternity when we talk about baptismal uh, uh, records in just a second, but somebody presents himself uh, saying, I'm the father of this child, was on a birth certificate. <coughs> yes, that's sufficient. Give me a copy of it. I'll, I'll make the notation that you are the father of that child. And, and I'll now, now keep that document in my separate file in case the mother says, how did his name get on the certificate? Well, it's on the birth certificate. I mean, I'm not going to contravene the birth certificate, but I have that document. So again, the note of, you can keep a separate file for that, uh, indicating on that supporting document, the page and entry number of the Sacramento records. Okay, go ahead. Again, keeping a separate file, that file is just a file for all changes in it, the? It could be. I, I don't know how many changes you're going to have. Are you going to have a separate file for your baptismal registry, one for marriage? It really, Father, depends on how, how thick that gets. Okay. I, I can't imagine it's going to get thick, but if it does, it, you know. It should be maintained in the buyer per se. Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly, oh, right. And I, and I would say it's close to the um, baptismal record, uh, close to the register as possible. But, Just but, since we don't have individual people's, files on individual people's right. other than the, the staff and volunteers, all the marriages eventually go to the diocese. Go to the diocese, right, right. So this would be just a, an overarching file that just keeps all of these sort of things. The supporting documentation, okay. right, right. So some permitted changes, I call these more sort of insubstantial changes is correct name, the correct, well, the correct date and correct adoptive parents may have to create a new um, record depending on, on what you're dealing with there, correct spelling, a new legal name, and adoptive parents. Adoptive parents is a special question which we'll deal with in just a second. Non-permitted changes, new godparents or new sponsors. And there's a little bit of pastoral note about that. You know, you know, if somebody's becoming delinquent as a new godparent, well, fine, name them, but the original record stands as is. Non-adopting step-parents, foster parents, does not get recorded in the baptismal record. A customary name or a nickname doesn't get recorded. Okay, they need to be legal changes. When we complete certificates, mm -hmm. it says, put in here the information that is in the register. Mm -hmm. If that information is in Latin or German or French, do we anglicize it, or do we put it in with the um, the grammatical endings on the words and all of that? that, that that's a very, that very is. that's a very good question, and I don't know. And Tammy's going to note that because we have to get back to you. Um, because if it is in French or Latin, and if you know French or Latin, and you can translate that for the person, I think the person would really, really appreciate that on the receiving end of. Um, but, 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 but I'm also thinking if, if, a name, if, if a name got Latinized, especially in the old registers, uh, in, instead of simply Francis, it's Franciscus, that's the way it got recorded as Franciscus in Latin, in the, in the baptismal register, for instance. And I would say you have to, you have to put Franciscus down on the certificate. But there's... Get into all the other endings and the various... Right, right, I mean, transcribe it. Francisca and Francisca and Exactly, and exactly. But for instance, like a date, I mean, it might help a person after doing gene genealogical research. If you know, you know, uh, what the French or the uh, Latin is for December or March or whatever, that might help. But I think the proper names should be in the original um, uh, format because that's the way they got recorded. Yeah, I have a good example of this. I ran across my aunt's uh, record in one of my parishes, and we'd always known her as Alice, and that's what everybody had always called her. Right. But it, the priest at the time wrote it in Latin, the yeah. saint's name, yeah. which would have been Aloysia. There you go. So the feminine form of Aloysius, mm -hmm. that's what was recorded. That's not, I don't think it was on her, um, oh, birth certificate. Like her legal document. Yeah. Yeah. A birth certificate, I think, right. said Alice, but the priest put it in the Latin form of the saint that uh, she was named after. So, you know, there, when you get the request and then you send it to them, they're like, who the heck is this? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But and we, we had, when we did this workshop earlier, a lady was there whose name was Betty, I think. Her legal name was Betty. But the priest at the time of baptism put Elizabeth in the record in English. That wasn't her legal name, so she went back later and said, 
this record needs to be changed. My legal name is Betty. So she did go back later and that change was made to the record itself and any subsequent certificate would have the Betty on it rather than Elizabeth. So I don't know if your aunt is alive or deceased, but you know, no, but, but, but now you, you know, or in the notations column after the fact, you might note that, well, her legal name was such and such. And from that point forward, we know that's that lady. So yeah, it's interesting. Older names are interesting, what they, what they used to do. The so. other option was Ethel Brenham is what they would have done for her. <laughs> Say that again, Ethel. Audrey, what they refer in the book as an Ethel Brenham. <laughs> so that's a very okay. close to saying statement. <laughs> very good, okay. <laughs> All right. So I have, I have a question. Go ahead. So in the world we live in, um, my question then becomes, so it seems really good that you can change your name yep. at that point. So if I have James, who comes up to me and is maybe potentially having some kind of identity crisis, yes. be named Destiny, yes. and brings legal documentation proving that he is Destiny, how does that work? Is that, is that a change that we would still we haven't make? We haven't come across that yet. So, so you will call us at that time. Oh, we will, so now yeah. You will call us, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 that's next year, probably. Right, no, but, but that's, not, that, that's not in the document. There's actually another situation that's in here that's not that, but, but that, that's, that's the culture we live in. And I would think that it probably goes into notations column, okay. probably, uh, that's my guess, but we're gonna consult with our county lawyers and say, What's going to happen here? So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, okay, uh, page 11. Uh, once specific data has been changed in the Sacramento record, the original data is not transcribed in certificates, but the change are. And that, hopefully, that's um, um, self explanatory. And then finally, I referred to this earlier about the, the situation with refugees. Every effort should be made to contact the parish of origin. If unsuccessful, see the mission record section, which we did earlier. Uh, make note of where the original record should be. Should be in Nigeria, Africa. It's not, but. Um, yeah, I, I dealt with that for marriage prep, so. Any questions about general norms? Who has access to records, how to make entries, how to make changes, who can request a certificate, missing records, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've got, a couple, I've got three questions here. So, if Monsignor. Uh, I'm gonna check, but I believe that the hospital in Valley City has separate records, like for baptism that occurred in the hospital and so on. Okay, we. Right. Those belong. Those. Right. Right. As far as the sister band, the presentation, there shouldn't be any reason why I should right. Right. record any of their things. Right. They, they, so, and Father Bachmar, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but what's his, yeah, your central hospital was there when you were at St. Santa Joachim, right? Mm -hmm. But when I did an emergency baptism at this hospital, they actually had a register in the hospital that you could record the information, but I took that same information and I communicated it to the parish as well. So the official record wasn't a register sitting in the <laughs> hospital room, it was back at the parish. So I think that was- I think that some hospitals have their own like protocols right. that they want correct. Right, exactly. But that's their record, not right. our record. Right. So exactly. we would communicate to our parish, our record, and we're going to deal with Mitch uh, baptisms in just a second. Did I see a hand over here? It was late when I was there eight, nine years ago. I think they found 50 years worth of baptisms that had not been afforded in the parish. Yeah. She actually had to text me a separate book. Yeah. So they didn't do it. They got it into the church record. Yeah, you do, do it. You manage it as best you can. And um, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So it's one of those questions of I don't see my, my baptism recorded in this register. Is there a neighboring register where it might be? Um, and pastors probably knew about that practice of keeping that separate register in the hospital and to perhaps look there. Okay, yes. Another note about confidentiality. I remember, um, I think this might have been when Erwin put that previous one out, mm -hmm. that he had said one of the reasons for that, there had been at that time a recent uh, lawsuit in Pennsylvania because a priest had handed over their sacramental books to a genealogy publisher uh -huh. that printed all of the mm -hmm. records Mm -hmm. Because of those being made public, there was a guy who lost out on a multi-million dollar inheritance mm -hmm. because it was proven he actually, there was an illegitimacy in the mm -hmm. past or whatever, and so he sued that priest for, or that, um, that parish for, for publishing 
um, records that were supposed to be confidential. Right. Um, and I don't remember how the lawsuit turned out or whatever. No, but no. It, but um, that, that type of thing is one of the reasons why they started like being more you know, strict. You know, you don't just give these out to exactly. Anybody. You certainly don't give them out to genealogists. Though. You don't give them out to genealogists. Our practice has been following the, the Census Bureau, and I don't know what year they're at, but like 75 years, we won't hand out anything newer than 75 years. Unless, um, is it now 40? Okay, yeah, I, so our website's out of date. Um, you know, right now, only the individual can, re if, it's, if it's after 1940, only the individual can request their own record. If it's older than that, we'll, we'll give, uh, you know, their, their um, uh, later generations the record. So it takes a time for, that kind of, to be careful about the confidential information, so yeah, be careful. Yeah, I remember getting a request in the previous parish where um, it was a relative and was really adamant about finding this one record. Yeah. And in the thing, it was notated that the child was illegitimate, I think the father was a relative, um, and they uh, wanted to know who, you know, get this baptism record, and it was, there was apparently some family secrets there that, uh, they um, wanted to get into it, and I, I, I think I consulted with the guy. Sure, sure, sure. And they ended up giving it out. No, exactly, consultant, yeah, exactly, because that's, yeah, they don't have a right to that, so, Father, did you? Same question. I've gotten a few that uh, they're the great, great, great grandchildren that are looking for their parents' marriage records, mm -hmm. but then I've also gotten people looking, since we have two cemeteries, looking for an unmarked grave um, of a relative. That, yeah. So as far as once people have passed, and it's been a substantial amount of time, and it's a relative of them, um, are, is that just our call, basically? It's, it's, yeah, it's your call. I mean, if they have a legitimate reason. Yeah. Again, the Mormons, we don't hand records over to them. They, they don't have, that's not legitimate. So, Who's but yeah. What's the reason? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think the Mormons? <laughs> It's not their record. They want to quote, quote, rebaptize them into their religion. They we don't. Do a, they do a religious ceremony. Yeah, they, they, uh. Oh. Yeah, they baptize the dead to become good Mormons. Oh, oh. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the Catholic Church has declared after investigating the theology of the Mormons that they're not actually Christians. They, do, do, do they baptize them later in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Their, their, their actual teaching is so different. They're not actually, it's not about that. Unlike a Lutheran or Baptist Avenue, which are valid, mm -hmm. theirs is not. So in a situation where somebody who was baptized Catholic and has now decided to become Mormon and they request their mm -hmm. baptism. They they can ask for their record. Okay. What they what they do with it is up to them. Okay, Yeah. Yeah. So, like, but we don't we don't take our registers and hand them over like you saying in Pennsylvania. We don't we don't publish that on the website. And there's this back and forth in the um, uh, our, um, genealogical community because some dioceses just hand them over because they're 100 years old, just go out and publish them all. And we don't do that. So that's just what we don't do. Okay. Uh, a couple things too. Hmm. That, uh, it, there had been a, um, a reference earlier about recording only those things uh, required by canon law. Yeah. Um, I know with the death registers, and over the years, mm -hmm. I've seen a wide variety. That's, I that's, know mine and that's, all of the really old ones. They have very detailed things of what people died from. That yep. were scalped by Indians. There were you know, different stuff. Uh, uh, like, and very, um, it was actually fun reading. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the way they would describe that. Um, and then other uh, places where there's you know, no uh, even uh, column for right. anything like right. that. Is there? Like, we'll, 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 we'll get to the death register at the very end of this oh, talk. Okay, okay. okay. And I'm glad your Sacramento records are bringing you great entertainment. That's <laughs> yeah, those folks were fun. Yeah, that, yeah, they can be good. Yeah, great. 